So the basic notion of test driven development, though, has to do with um, basic agile principle, which is that testing is an essential part of development, and that it is fundamentally incorrect to be developing code without testing simultaneously. And by simultaneously, <coughs> by simultaneously, it really means simultaneously. That's a little too loud. At least it's it's echoing here. Can you turn it down just a touch? The the um, So the, the, um, the basic notion <coughs> is that testing is an integral part of, of agile processes. And ideally, you want to be testing as early as possible in the coding cycle, and as often as possible in the coding cycle. And by early, I mean before you actually write your code. So the whole notion of test-driven development has to do with really test-first development. It's really the same thing. So the, the rationale is that if you have the test first, do a lot of good things. Is you can reduce the overhead of actually writing the code because the test will make things go faster. And, that's, and my experience of that is that it is absolutely true. In other words, my code gets. <laughs> this is just not my day. I think we'll skip the new version of Java for the moment. No, do not get this all. <laughs> anyway, my, my experience with test driven development is exactly that. I think I pro could probably code at twice the speed that I used to be able to code at entirely because I have the tests in place. Is that I don't code more than a couple of minutes without running tests. And the point of that is that you eliminate all the uncertainty associated with the code that you just wrote. Is that I don't know about you, but when I'm writing code, half the time I'm worrying that I've broken something. And if I'm writing something complicated, I don't know works or not, right? It's how much time have you spent at your desk with a pencil and a piece of paper trying to figure out whether you've got a fence post problem or not, right? Is there an off by one error here? Is there not an off by one error here? If you have a test in place, you just run the test, and if it fails, then you're off by one and you adjust the code. So it, it reduces a lot of time, it reduces a lot of tension, and it eliminates a lot of the stress of programming, it makes it generally a better, a better place to be. So th that's the basis of it. That's where it came from. Now, I'm also going to talk to
single one is holy. It is not executed in the course of running through the story that has accompanied the Lord's Supper. Which is to say, you should not have any arguments or other methods just because you might need them in your faith. There should be no branches in your code just because something might come up and you haven't thought about it. So if you want to follow me on some of the other things, we use church as a support text. We use also the stuff on the outside are the clients, the classes that are using the object that we're testing. And the stuff on the inside are the things that we are using ourselves inside the class. Is everyone following me? So we're simulating two levels of things. We're simulating external stuff and we're simulating internal stuff. The external stuff are the classes we're talking to, the internal stuff are the classes we're using. 
Somehow they're going to have to get in there, though. So that's another issue with respect to doing these kinds of testing. You have to write the classes for them to do it. So if your code is using an object which is not fully formed or which might not exist yet, something other than a string or something obvious, you're going to have to do some kind of injection in order to get that object into your in, into the object of the test. So everyone with me again. So let's again talk about our database. If you're talking to the database through an object that's emulating the database, well, if that's used internally, then what you're going to have to do is pass your database emulator into your object as a constructor or some kind of injection routine, or if you're using an injection framework, you can get it in there that way. But one way or another, you've got to get the object under, you've got to get an emulation object into your object that you're testing rather than the real one. So injection is a big part of this. We still have our three level system, though, because of our donut. setter. 
and then call another setter and see if it still behaves that way. And call every possible combination of setters in every possible order and make sure that the behavior is still correct. And you, none of us are going to want to do that, believe me. So putting setters in particular inside your code makes it untestable. So you can't do that. Getters and setters are really, really, really bad idea. I do. I have a whole ses session on that in some conferences we're going to do. I'm not going to do it here. But it's a really, really, really bad idea. So you can't, of course, eliminate it. Most of you are probably programming in C Sharp and Microsoft platforms. So you've got to use properties. But generally speaking, properties and getter and setter methods are anathema. They are bad. You should not use them. And you should certainly never start writing a class definition and then put getters and setters and properties in just by default, just by rote. A lot of people, the first thing they do after they write the word class is they put in getters and setters and properties for every field in the class. Stop that. Right? Only put in the ones that you need to have there to be able to talk to the Microsoft framework. Okay? But the real issue here with respect to this session is testability. If you're damaging the testability of your system by putting those getters and setters in. So we're going to be using two kinds of mocking strategies when we talk about this. There are spies and there are mocks. And which one you use depends a lot on what level of testing you're doing. So the notion of a mock is that a mock is a simulation of some class, or some interface, but it's a complete simulation. Uh, the methods of the mock are usually called stubs, and they just do something reasonable. Usually they pretend to work. A spy is a wrapper around an existing object. So the purpose of the spy is you call a method on the spy, and then usually what it does is just chain through to the method on the contained thing. But the fact that you have written a spy means that you can monitor messages as they pass through this object to the real object. That way you don't have to simulate behavior in the real object because you've got a real object under there. But you can still monitor how many times the methods of the object are called or, or whether they were called or even modify their behavior, which is sometimes useful. Is that the, the, the pure test-driven development guys say, don't use spies. The, the acceptance test-driven development guys use nothing but spies. Because they just want to monitor and observe the behavior of the system and verify that it's behaving the way they expect it to. Okay. Um, the other issue has to do with dependency injection, you need to put them in. I don't know why that display has that comic in it. It's not helpful. <laughs> I did something wrong with the display yesterday. Let's ignore that. <laughs> all right, let's look at our basic process though. Is that, first of all, you add a small test. Then you run all of the tests and you watch your new test fail. Right? Remember, we're writing the test before we're writing the code. So we'll write the smallest possible implementation of a method that we can write and have it fail. So you, most of these methods will look like return false <laughs> or throw this exception. Then we make one small change. In fact, we make the smallest change we possibly can in order to make it succeed, and then we run the tests and watch it succeed. Everyone following me? Now, the change that we're making is not a bogus change. The change that we're making to go from the failure to succeed state is real code. It might not handle every possible eventuality, but it will handle one case, one use case, if you will, for the specific method of the specific object that we're talking about. So the next thing you do is refactor. You eliminate any duplication or so forth that was caused by, by the code that you just wrote. And then you go around the cycle again. And you keep adding tests until everything's working. You, you, you don't test again after you refactor it before you write the next test. I suppose I should, yes. The whole point of the refactoring is, well, I don't know, actually. I suppose I should, but this refactoring is just removing duplication. But it used to work, and it should still work, so yeah. You still want to see that green. that's our basic cycle. You let it fail, you write enough, just enough code to let it succeed, and then spin back around. And if the method doesn't do as 
as much as it needs to do yet, then you write another test. And around you go. So notice that the next thing you do is write another test, not modify the first test. Because once you get a test that's working, you don't want to be modifying the code and the test at the same time. So around you go. This cycle is maybe five minutes, if that. So you're testing constantly. We want to get the green as quickly as possible. So the, the amount of code that we want to write, we, we want to keep it small. I have my usual percentage screen percent. So you write the test, you make it run using whatever fluid you possibly can because we want to get the green quickly. I'm always nervous when I see a red bar. As soon as I see a red bar, I want it gone in five minutes. So let's look about this as a design process. Is think about the problem of implementing an API. Right? You're going to write a service and you need an API for that service. Or even at the lower level, if you think about it at any level, you can think of any object as a service. They're really the same thing. And you need to write an API. Now, we've all wrestled with APIs that are impossible to use. Where you try and do some kind of program. API fights you every stretch of the way. There's 10 steps that you have to do in order to do one simple thing. And you, the API is very delicate. You get one argument wrong, and all of a sudden everything blows up, or things blow up for reasons that you can't even fathom. Why, how does that situation exist? Right? You always get to the, did the clown who wrote this thing ever use it question. Now, the answer to this question usually is no. In other words, the vast majority of that we are using are written by people that are writing the API in isolation. Is everyone following? So everything that they're doing is guessing. Every method they write, they're guessing that somebody's going to need to call it at some point. Every argument to every method is something that they're guessing will be useful in some scenario that they're guessing might happen. I can guarantee that 90% of those guesses are wrong. So guess-driven development doesn't work very well. GDD. <laughs> what we're trying to do then, if we take a test-driven approach, is we're trying to eliminate the guesswork insofar as that's possible. So rather than starting out with a large, elaborate interface design with some class we're trying to Together, we start out with nothing. And then we start writing some code that's going to use the class that we're writing and implement only enough so that the code that's using the class can do what it has to do. 
Everyone see what I'm getting at? That code that's using the class that we're writing, that's our test. shouldn't ever write an API in isolation. In other words, the right way to develop an API is to develop an application that's going to use the API. And if you think that there are going to be several applications that are going to be very different from each other using the API, then you've got to write the minimal example of that other application. I'm an Agile guy, right? So I don't believe that I can, that, I, that it's possible for me to sit down up front and do everything. It's that I expect my design to evolve incrementally as the systems evolve. So adding methods, removing that, well not removing, but adding methods, adding arguments occasionally, that kind of stuff, that's perfectly reasonable to me. I see no problems with that. Right now the, the uh, cost, though, is that every time you make a change, you've got to run the tests. But we have our tests. Right? It's dangerous if you don't have it. Working this way is, is very dangerous. But since we have all the tests, we can guarantee that any change that we made in order to make the new code work is not going to break any of the existing code. So we can make things evolve incrementally. If the API is eventually going to be used in a company-wide kind of way, probably what I would do is let it be officially unstable for a while. And then at some point just say, OK, it's done. From this point forward, we're going to call it stable. So that everybody is, they won't be surprised if something changes. And of course, you want to try and minimize breaking changes if you can, obviously. But bear in mind, if you're following that rule I was discussing earlier, where you're asking objects for help, where, you're at, where you're, you're, your requests to the objects are pretty high level, the odds of the API changing are actually pretty small. Because the requests that you're making tend to be domain level requests, and the domain is not changing that much. I'll talk more about that in a second. I just said that. So really, we have a cart and horse situation, right? Is that people usually wrong order, right? Is they write the, they write the, they think of the client code as driving the subsystem, right? In the sense that they write the subsystems first. And what I'm arguing is that you should write the client code first, not the subsystem first. Because then the, the interface to the subsystem will be the minimal interface. So it will be exactly what you need for the client code to work and nothing else. Right? You've got to write both eventually. So we're really, we're not talking about more or less work. We're just talking about doing the work in a different order. So we start with stories then. We're working in this way. And what, it, now at this point, I'm up at the kind of acceptance test design level when I'm discussing the process. But the, the, we start with our stories, with our actual user story, which should be narratives, tracking the user as they work through some process. Right? All of us have seen that as an X, I need Y to do Z form of story. Um, that form has some use, but it's one of those things that's not actually a very good crutch. The, the, back when we were all doing OO design and using inheritance heavily, everyone remembers the is a test, right? Is that if you could say is a, then inheritance was, was called for. And that's, of course, nonsense. Because you could say is a in lots of situations where inheritance has got no business the same applies to as an X, I need Y to do Z, is that saying as a user of some sort, I need this button to make my life easy, that is not a user story, I'm sorry. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? A user story is the user has some small problem that they need to solve, and it describes uh, as a narrative, a short narrative, of how they're going to solve that problem. By short, my rule of thumb is that it should fit onto an index. Now, the, the, the value of the as a x, i, need y form is that very early in the process, you don't want to flush out all of your stories because you want to eliminate waste. It's that it might turn out that that story is not actually a story that you're going to need. So you don't want to put even five minutes into flushing the story out because you might need it. So it's a kind of a placeholder for the real story. You'll replace it, though, with the real story when you get close to the point where you might be implementing so it's part of your planning process. You look at the backlog and the top 10 things on the backlog, right? Things that are likely to go into production within the next few weeks. 
Those you flush out into bigger stories so that you can actually assess them. There's no information in it as an X, I, D, Y, because you don't know what to build by looking at that. So you need to flush it out a little bit further. So when we look at this as a design process, then we're starting with a story. And we're implementing a fragment of the story as our test. And then we're stubbing it out with mocks, writing the tests, and refactoring. But now what we're refactoring are interfaces. So this is another layer. So this loop looks a lot like the TDD loop we were just looking at, but this is really kind of a layer around the outside of it. So the purpose of this is to make the interface correct. We implement a part of the story against an interface that does not exist yet. And then we find, hey, writing this code is hard. This interface is garbage. I'm not at all worried about calling my own interfaces garbage. I'm a realist. Okay. So then you fix the interface. We still haven't implemented. We're working against an interface. And then you tweak the client code a little bit more. And then you get it to work. And you keep doing that until you're happy with the client code. You look at the client code and say, this is good. It's simple. It's easy to understand. It does what it needs to do. And then you can start thinking about implementing the interface. And now we're into hardcore tester development. So it's really the same thing applied recursively, the same technique applied recursively, but we're moving out towards the, towards the interface of the object and trying to decide that the interface of the object is optimal. We're designing our interfaces now. So the story then is going to have a, is a narrative. It's something that exists in the domain level. So the only way that we can stay sane as we're going through this process is to make the code reflect a domain directive. So that's another thing that we get out of designing or developing in this way, is we have a one-to-one -one relationship between the stories and the code. Or put it another way, the abstractions that exist in the stories will also exist as the key abstractions in the code. If something changes at the story level, it's going to change at the code level as well. I've spelled Jabberwock in different ways, so I've got a red bar there. <laughs> oh, I spelled Dragon in different ways, too. Right? Oh, well. <laughs> I have two red bars, so clearly my slides need test. <laughs> but the, the, um, the point is, is that I've got this one-to-one -one connection between the story and the code. I start with the story, and then I implement the story in code, basically. And I'm trying to keep that one-to-one -one connection because, again, in the natural world, we need that. Because what's going to change, right? If we're trying to write our code to be as, as isolated from changes as possible. We're trying to let it accommodate changes as they come along. Well, where are the changes are happening? They're happening at the domain. So if you have a completely abstract, mathematically precise, perfect subsystem, perfect by some definition, and then you've got the UI, which obviously has to map into the domain, or else you don't have a program that's useful. But if there's some weird map, some complicated bunch of junk, mediators and facades and all this stuff to hook one to the other, you've blown it. Because a change happens at the domain level, you change the UI, and then what? And that's something we've got a month's work to try and make things work. If, on the other hand, the change in the domain gives you a change in the UI which maps directly to the objects on the server, you know exactly where to look when a change happens. It becomes much, much easier to put a change into your code. So we really want this one-to-one. -one. Now, behavior-driven development is another way of looking at the same test-driven development kind of way of working. And behavior development driven development is really just another variant on TDD, and Dan Orton is happy to tell you that. So what he's doing here is that he started out by saying, well, our test method names should be real sentences, which makes sense. So the basic idea here, though, is that he, he came up with this convention of saying the test fails when something occurs. It's a little sentence that's actually describing what we're actually testing. Now when you do that, what that means is that you can start writing automated testing tools 
which just use things like the names of the test methods to generate reasonable error traces when the tests fail. So you can look at the output of your testing tool and tell exactly what went wrong. So testing tools that are VDD tools like Cucumber do exactly that, is they give you a, a report that's readable because the names of things make sense. So that's a, that, if that was all VDD was, that would be something to get excited about. A simple idea, but it's a really powerful one. So the test's name should be sentences. But better yet, if it's in a form where you're always talking about when it should fail, the test should fail if this happens, then if you know when, do you know that then when the test fails, it has happened? Everyone following me here? Now, I personally will not get, let these get too complicated. I would rather, much rather have five methods than something that says, this test should fail if A and B and C or if G, right? <laughs> that's, that's, that's too complicated, right? Just break it up into several test methods so that you can keep track of this stuff. Then he starts saying, well, let's think in terms of behavior, right? So we're testing whether a customer is, we could test, I guess, whether a customer is valid. <coughs> But instead, I would rather test behavior. In other words, I'm not testing whether a customer is valid. I don't really even know what that means, and I don't really care. What I do care is that when I'm testing the behavior of an order, is the order shipping itself correctly to the customer? That's a useful thing to know. And that isolates me from the implementation of my order. I know that it's behaving correctly. So that's the other key powerful concept in VDD, that we're testing that the object under test is behaving the way we expect it to. And we do that by looking at the outflow of messages that respond, that, that, that occur because of, because of some stimulus. So you start with business rules then, the behavior driven design. You're really doing a kind of analysis, in other words. And then you can create tests based on the business rules. Interestingly, the list of tests become your functional requirements, the equivalent of that. In other words, in the same way that designed by coding, my, my technique hooks up your stories directly to your objects. This is hooking up the business requirements directly to the objects. And you need to test both. These are complementary techniques, not, not fighting, they're not fighting with each other. So everyone following me here? So the business requirement, you know, when this happens, this should happen. Right? If, if, there's, if the address is invalid, something should happen to the order. Right? That's what we're, that's what we're developing here, is a set of tests that are directly implemented in the business requirement. So acceptance test driven development just takes it up another level, right? It basically says, if all of the business requirements are satisfied, then we have an acceptance. So this is going way beyond just checking that the code works. This is giving, some, this is giving us information that's actually useful. It's telling us that the code works in a way that is valuable. It actually does what it's supposed to do. So let's get back to the stories a little bit, though, and talk about how this would proceed. So actually, before I do that, are there, are there any questions at all about what I was just saying? Is that I, I get nervous when the rooms get too quiet. I just can't believe that I'm being that coherent. The U.S. is a subject. The UAT tests are they becoming more integration tests? Because you're, you're testing more. They're kind of, they're kind of another level again. It's another thing again, right? UAT is the user acceptance test, right? And the, the, there we're talking about the users going through the code and checking for usability. At least that's the main thing that we're trying to determine. Um, that's another level again. That's another higher level again. And TDD kinds of techniques are not getting up to the UAT level, though. 
they're not meant to address that. For one thing, sometimes it's hard to automate your engineering tools, right? Because they really are testing usability. And you need to do that, of course, as we again talking in the context of Agile, is that customer feedback is everything. So in a way, those are our most important tests. So somewhere, in other words, what we're doing here up to this point, all that we're doing is testing that the system is behaving the way the user thought it should have behaved the last time we talked to the user. But there's another really big question, which is the last time we talked to the user, did he actually know how the system should be behaved? Once he gets it in his hands, he might change his mind. He might have forgotten something, or, or it just might turn out that he was working with some kind of fantasy about how things ought to work, and when he actually gets the real code in his hands, he's decided that he did not actually like it. And that's okay, that's, the, that's what, what we're doing, we're doing Azure software. So the user acceptance tests are really a, a level above this again. Those are hot products. So we're back into as a, I want to, so that. As a banking customer, I want to withdraw some money from an ATM so that I don't have to wait in line. This is a real story. This is not a functional requirement hidden in story form. We're not talking about the UI. Remember that the output of the design process is a program. And a UI is part of the program. Or to put it another way, the UI design is the output of the design process, not the input. So specifying an output as the beginning of your process is a really bad idea. We want to specify the inputs, not the output. So, a banking customer is, assigning, is defining a, a user level, domain level role. I'm not talking about a computer program. And we do it so that I don't have to wait in line at the bank. That's an important piece of information. The user, in other words, this might not be an important information from the point of view of writing the code, but it might be an extremely point, important piece of information, right? As a member of a company, as an employee of a company, I need to hold meetings sometimes, I guess to resolve my problems. But what's my real goal with respect to holding meetings? If I was gonna write that story properly, what would I write? And I would write as somebody who has to get together with, with people, somebody who has got work to be done. I wanna avoid meetings as much as possible in order to be able to be productive. So everyone see what I'm getting at here? In other words, my goal, is to not go to meetings. If I was gonna write a meeting scheduler, I would wanna write a meeting scheduler that guaranteed that I satisfied my goal of not going to meetings. I wanna capture that in the story if I can. And if we're gonna write a program like that, I guarantee you it's not gonna look like Outlook. Right, all of us, I imagine, have tried to schedule a meeting in Outlook. It's hellish. You've gotta bring up the calendars of all of the people that might attend and You've got to find the slot that's available in everybody's calendar, and you ask yourself, well, if this idiot program knows enough to be able to draw everybody's calendar, surely it could find the first time slot that we're all available, and just tell me, <laughs> right? It doesn't do any of that, right? If I'm trying to avoid meetings, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a program that lets all of us decide on an agenda, and if we can't decide on an agenda, there's no point in having a meeting. If we can decide on an agenda, then I can allow the system to schedule it. It will find the first available time slot that we're all available and schedule it. I don't care when it schedules it, as long as it's during the workday sometime. Is everyone over here? You would never see a calendar. There's no reason to ever display a calendar if you're doing it that way. Sort of. <laughs> yeah, but it's still visual and you still have to do it manually. <laughs> but it doesn't do the agenda thing. And then, so the point here is that it's not satisfying my goal of not going to meetings. So capturing that in the definition of the story is useful. Stories exist as scenarios. There might be several ways that the story could play out, right? The account, so we have this issue of the account has sufficient funds. That's my scenario, right? It's a withdraw scenario. And there's this complicated condition here. Given that the account holds enough money and the ATM card, and the ATM has enough cash. When the customer 
that request cash, right? That's our burden. I expect these results. I have to ensure that the count is debited and ensure that the cash is expensed and so forth. Right? The BDD testing tools use this form. So it's a small predicate language. How, how does this work with the uh, use case? I, I could, how does this work with use cases if you all require A story in Agile is a scenario of a use case. An epic is a use case. It's just a change in vocabulary. It's not a change in anything. All right, so we want to be able to write our tests to cover all possible scenarios of a given story, or at least all the ones that are going to come up in, in the program that we're writing. Here's another one. Same basic form, different conditions, and different outputs. <coughs> And then you can make that executable directly if you want to. Now right, here's how JBehave does it. That's a Java version of Cucumber. Cucumber is a Ruby tool. Also. Ooh, ooh. Uh, Cucumber JVM. It's been out for two years. Oh, really? Yeah. Shows you where I am. How <laughs> where I am. Great. That's good. You know, but in any of these, I, I, I've been using JVM, so I haven't, I haven't bothered to check into the cucumber thing. But the, you know, whatever works works. Right. But you can see how we're working in the Java world, right? We have we're using annotations. The, 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 we're using annotations in order to do the given and the when and the then clauses in the same as we were just looking at. And then we're coding those conditions using code because that's convenient. Yeah, there's like there's a dozen tools. That Okay? So we have general principles here. The test should be abstract so that you don't have to change it. Right? In other words, we want to be testing in terms <coughs> of the external behavior of the objects, the abstract behavior of the objects, not the specific behavior of the objects. When the test fails, there are a few possibilities. It could be a bug, in which case we fix it. It could be that the behavior that we're testing has moved someplace or somehow somehow been modified by somebody else as part of a check-in, in which case we want to change the test. Or it could be that the behavior that we're testing is no longer correct, in which case we're also going to have to delete the test entirely. Okay, that's the biggest problem because we have to verify that the behavior that we're testing is So getting back to the stuff I was talking about earlier, I was talking a little bit out of turn. We really want to decouple the tests from the code. So I have a rule of thumb that I use, which I've named after myself for lack of a better way to do it. Basically what I'm saying is at any point, you should be able to replace the implementation of a class. And by replace, I really mean replace. Eliminate all of the fields and replace them with different fields that have different names and different types. Leave the interface in place, right, all the public method names, but replace the bodies of every method, of every public method of the class. Replace all of the private methods of the class with different methods, and the users of your class should not know that any of that has happened. That's how you keep it testable. So the way you keep it testable is by following the rule that I was discussing earlier, that the, the, you don't get information, you don't get implementation. Right now, this is a core object-oriented principle, but this applies in spades to service architectures. And service architectures are, I believe, the, the wave of the future, because um, as we add more and more cores to the hardware, more and more our programs are gonna start looking like services and less like individual objects, because our objects will be running on individual threads, doing work that we ask them to do in the background. So over time, we have to start thinking this way, or our code 
is not going to be able to scale up to a multi core environment. So those getters and setters, well, they, they can't survive in this world. Because if you change a field, you'd have to change the getter. And I just told you that if you change a field, it shouldn't impact the outside world. So I would put it another way, I'm not assuming anything about an implementation. This code is assuming something about an implementation. It's assuming that a dollar has a value that can be represented as a float. This is not going to work in an internationalized environment. Right? We're assuming the float. So we want to avoid them. So this is stuff that I already talked about. The law of Demer, talk only to your friends. Again, we need to talk about this in the context of testability. Is that the basic idea here is that um, we don't want to do code like this because this is not testable code. Does everyone see what I'm saying? Is we can test the end of the chain, but we can't test that something's gone wrong in the middle. I should also say there's a difference between a classic chain wreck and the sequence that Neil was showing you this morning that, that you see a lot in the <coughs> uh, functional programming environments where you'll have you know, some, some data structure dot map dot reduce because there every method is returning this. Does everyone see what I'm saying? Is that every method in that chain is returning the object that the method was passed to. So really all that we've done there is we've taken one method and broken it up into three chunks, which we're calling independently on the outside, but it's effectively a single method call. Is everyone understanding the difference that I'm trying to talk about? So that's a valuable technique. That kind of chaining is valuable. This kind of chaining is not. If these methods each return a different kind of object, we're in deep trouble because we can't test the objects. When, when every method returns the object that it was passed to, we're still testing the object correctly even if we have a chain. What we're doing is testing that some sequence of methods on that object work the way we expect it to. So why, why can't I test that You could test them independently, but remember what we're trying to test here is real code. What we're, the, the test that's driving the system. Because we're trying to test the whole system, not just the individual pieces. And you can't necessarily guarantee that the interactions are going to be correct simply because the individual pieces were tested. In other words, if you're testing in isolation, you often miss things that have to do with testing in the context of a complex inter interaction. It's not a thing, not necessarily It's not, yeah, simply speaking, yeah, in theory, if you can fully test get body and get tail and wag then you should be okay, in theory. In practice, it never occurred to you that you would be calling get tail on whatever was returned from get body, so you didn't test that. That well, that's the next slide. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> we'll get to that in the next slide. Right? But the the um, the other issue here is that let's say get body returned null, right? You could have a perfectly legitimate test that passed and verify the get body return null in some contexts. But then you try and do that here and it blows up. So this is very difficult to test. So that's what we want. That's what we really want. And we don't really want WAG because that itself is not abstract enough. He might express happiness by slobbering all over me, for example, instead of WAG. This dog in particular would express happiness. Um, the other issue with respect to tests is that you should always write the tests so that they will leave the test framework in a known state. So I, I, one of the things that annoys me no end is when I'm working in a group and I come across a set of tests and I can't just add a new test to the set because somebody, some previous test has kind of made a mess of things and hasn't cleaned up. If you need to create it, and this goes all the way out to the OS, 
you need to create a file in order to test something, you better delete the file. The fact that you created a file in order to test something and there's a file with that name already there, you better move it someplace safe, create a test file in a known state of a known size, run your test and then put the original one back. And I prefer to do that in the test code itself rather than doing it in the test framework. If you do it in the test harness, it, 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 you've got your tests now scattered into two different places and it's hard to keep them in phase with each other. Okay. So any questions about any of this stuff that I was just talking about? So, oops, I'm going to start then with a little story. And this, I, I, I've done this deliberately. This is the same story I'm using in that little 10 minute tape I was talking about at the beginning of things so that you can follow along and measure the two things again. I want to do login. And I want to do login as a story. So to do that, I need what's called a system metaphor. A system metaphor is a kind of milieu in which the story occurs. My metaphor here is a bank with a guard standing at the door. So if I write login in the context of my metaphor, it looks like this. The guard asks the customer to sign in, checks the signature against the stored signature card. If they match, the guard lets them into the door. Is this making sense to everyone? So this is universal. This is tied into the domain. This is what we want to implement. So now we have to start thinking about roles. As people talk about actors, but the actors on the left, it's the role that we care about, the one on the right. So what are the roles in this system? Well, there's a card. There's a card file, signature card, signatures, customers. These are all potential classes. Bear in mind, as we do implementation, that <coughs> the fact that the same human being will log on to the system sometimes in one role and sometimes in another, that's completely immaterial from a design point of view. The fact that the same human being sometimes logs on to my timesheet authorization system as a manager so that he or she can approve timesheets, and at other times logs onto the same system as an employee so he or she can fill out his or her own timesheet is irrelevant. I do not care that they're the same person. What I care about are the roles. So here are the basic roles. So let's do some implementing. I'm living dangerously here. Clips came up when I didn't want it, and now it won't come up when I do. There we go. So what we're looking at here is a basic test harness that I put together just to kind of demonstrate how things work in the .NET world. It will be different and different in minor ways. Um, if you're using uh, any kind of mocking framework, they all work more or less the same way. In this case, I'm using a Java mocking framework called Makito. Um, in the .NET stuff, I haven't done any .NET net programming in about a year and a half now, so I'm probably, probably behind the curve. Last time I did it, I was using MOQ, Mock with a Q, which I was pretty happy with. But Mock with a Q at the time, I don't know if they fixed it, but it wouldn't let me mock static methods, which was kind of annoying. They said, I don't know if they fixed that by now, but it's, it's a, it was a, a, a minor problem. Um, I, there are other frameworks that you can use for mocking, of course, because Microsoft has its own, but for some reason, nobody that I knew was actually using it, which told me that I shouldn't be using those of you that know more about that, uh, I won't argue with you and you say that there are better frameworks in the Microsoft systems right now. Um, basically, what you do in the mocking framework is that, and here I'm extending the mock class just so that I can pull methods out of it. It's just a convenient way to pull methods out of it. With that, I'm going to say power mockito dot in front of everything. Um, here's my basic test framework. This is a test for the whole, this is called before I run any of my tests after class is run, after I run all my tests. Before is run before every test. So it's doing basic cleanup or basic setup for every test. After is being run after every test. 
what I'm doing in my setup. In this case, it's creating a new instance of the object I'm trying to test. Right? The TDD object that I'm testing is got nothing in it right now, really. And then there are the individual tests, which can take various kinds of forms. And I'll spend a minute looking at this just so just, uh, you'll be familiar with the sorts of things that these kinds of test frameworks provide. But um, what I'm saying here is I want to test that this thing actually throws an all pointer exception. And then I'm throwing an all pointer exception. <laughs> just to demonstrate that. Here, this is just a raw test, it just tests somehow. So in order for this to fail, one of these assertions has, has to fail. And there's a huge set of them. Assert equals, assert not equals, assert null, assert not null, assert this, assert that, assert true, assert false. The first argument is usually the thing that you expect, and the second argument is the real thing. So I'm asserting here that the object under tests foo method returns zero. Okay, is so everyone following how this works? So um, this is actually a little test, right? Is that if I if I um, if I run it, there we go. Hopefully it'll work. If it doesn't work, I'm probably not going to spend time making it work. I'm going to run it as a unit test, and I have a read bars on that, right? If I if, if I set up the test originally so the test would fail. So if I come back, back here and I make this do something else, I'll make the foo expect a one. Oops. Now when I run the test, it's, gonna, it's going to um, give me red bar. Yeah. OK? So we want to get to green as quickly as possible, so I'll put it back to zero. I should say when I'm doing this kind of development, I'll often just do everything in one file, just because messing around with 15 different files when you're putting this stuff together is just too complicated. So I'll do everything in one file. And I'll just leave this stuff in place and think about the story, which I put in a comment. So the guard asks the customer to sign in. The guard finds the customer's signature card in the card file, et cetera, et cetera. So we need to make things work is that we're probably going to need a guard class. Right? It's going to have to have some method. I'm not sure what that method is going to be. Let's make a test. What are we testing for? Um, the <coughs> a registered customer should be able to log in. Full length, even OK. And it has a return point. So that's our basic test. A registered, I'm meaning it's got a card in the file. Right? So everyone with me here. So I then say to the guard, well, I can't actually create a guard. So I can't create a guard because there is no instance of the guard, right? I could create a mock of one just by doing it hand by hand. I could also say mock the guard interface. And my testing framework now, what it's going to do is it's going to provide a default implementation of that interface where everything succeeds. And I could use my mocking framework then to modify the behavior of that. Right? Is, that is everybody seeing what I'm going on? That's what I would do in the real world. I'm going to erase this and just implement it here because I think it'll make the process more transparent if I actually have the implementation in front of us. Okay? So I could say class concrete card implements And now I have a concrete guard that I can work with and I can test that. All right? 
Now, what do I want the guard to do? I want it to um, not log in, but verify my customer's credentials. Or maybe if I'm just saying that I, I'm abstracting too much. I, have, I, I, I always do this, and I have to force myself not to. I didn't talk about credentials. I talked about signatures. Okay, so we're going to here. I better pass in a customer to do that, which means I better have a customer. Is everyone following me so far? I'm going to have to have a concrete customer too. Sure, I'll just mock it for the moment because it's easier. So now I have a concrete customer that I can work with. And I can pass that concrete customer into my guard down here in my test. Now I'm red, right, because I need to add the method, right? This method isn't doing anything yet. But this, remember, is going to be real code. This thing that I'm writing here is going to be real code. And I can go and say to the guard, and I'm going to pass uh, the customer. A customer. A customer. Thank you. All right. Does everyone follow me here? I want to start out by having this fail. But then I look at this and I go, oh, whoa, whoa, wait. <laughs> it's the, right now, it's a void. That can't work. I suppose I could make this Boolean. I could make it fail. Simple as kludge that I can get away with to make it fail. Um, what am I doing wrong? Hmm? Oh, thank you. <laughs> So it returns false, and then I can assert, let's do this a simple way, true. Acceptance test level. I'll make it. I'll make it succeed, right? But this is not real code, right? I've got to make real code happen here. So I'm still going to make sure that it succeeds because I want it. Oops, it didn't succeed. So what did I do wrong? This is returning true. It's ignoring customers, so that's fine. Is everyone over here? Do you need to go back and check if it fails still? Well, no, because I just did that. I'm in, I'm in the middle of my loop now. You corrected your test. I have corrected my test, but I should have corrected it so that it was actually correct. So let's put it back to fail. It's a good point. Let's put it back to the fail for the moment. Because I don't have real code in here. It should fail until I get some real code in. All right, now I look at this though, and I'm going, wait a minute, this isn't. For one thing, what am I going to, how do I, how can I really, just knowing that the customer is valid, well, do I actually know that, right? In, in other words, I really want to compare the customer's signatures and make sure that everything is working the way it's supposed to be working. More to the point, if I'm going to be using this in the real world, then 
I've got to have some kind of token that indicates that I've got a valid customer here because I know just from experience that I'm going to have to pass that token further into the rest of the system. I go back and I look at my story and I go, well, wait a minute, there's no notion of a token here. So the problem, what I've just done, done now is uncovered a flaw in my story. I've uncovered a design level flaw. So I'll say, okay, I'm not going to just allow the customer into the room. What I'm going to do is issue a badge to the customer. And allow them into the room. All right, that's going to be my token. It's a badge. It works in the context of our metaphor. So everyone following what I'm saying? So now I need a badge. And it doesn't, it doesn't have to do anything yet, so I'll just mock it. Verify customer signature is going to have to return a badge. Is everyone with me? I want it to fail. I'll have to go down here and modify some things to make it work. It's not a boolean anymore, it's a badge. I can't assert a null is true, but I want to assert a minimum not null. Is everyone with me? And then I run my test and it'll show the truth. Seeing how this is, written, is that in the process of writing this test, I'm finding flaws at the design level and fixing them. And as I'm finding flaws at the design level, the design is improving. And I'm gradually developing interfaces then that are the minimal set of interfaces that I need to make this all work. I think I understand. I mean, I do understand the principle, but maybe I'm just going to hear some in this case, I mean, you've been given a, a use case or a story, whatever, from, I don't know, somebody who was a real man expert. Yeah. He says, okay, it's going to be hard, and it's a room, yeah. and it's going to be a And you come back to them and say, well, in fact, you need to use badges. And they're going to ask you why. You're going to say, because software design is dictated. No, I'm not going to say that's that. I'm going to say that once you get in the room, let's say we're doing a banking application. Yeah. So what I'm, they're going to say, why do you need a badge? And I'm going to say, once I get in the room, the Teller is going to have to somehow identify the customer and make sure that they're who they say they are. And but there's no teller in the store. The room, not right? yet, because we're looking at it in isolation. Okay, so maybe I'm splitting. We are splitting here, because we're looking at it in isolation. Right? But in other words, the, the and maybe if I wasn't starting out with it in isolation, I would have come up with the notion of a badge to begin with. Okay, but the, the fact that the, the uh, main issues I'm trying to get across here is, first of all, the way that this is a design process in addition to being a testing process. That I'm using a test as a way of driving the design. And the second thing that I'm trying to get across here is the fact that I am modeling a story directly, at least as directly as I can. So what I'm ending up with then are classes that map directly to classes in the story. So we're seeing how this is working. I, I can keep going like this forever, right? Is that, is that you see how this works, right? You do one thing and then you get it working. The next thing I would do is I would come down here and I'd replace this with terminal with a little bit of code to create a valid badge. But in order to create a valid badge, I'm probably going to have to create a valid customer, <coughs> right? So I'm going to have to then also go up and do a little bit of modification to the customer class. And I'm just going to do this incrementally, adding one test at a time, getting it to work. Does this make sense to you? Okay, but the first thing I want to do is I would like to get the this one method correct. So rather than just returning null, I'd have to say, I don't know, what would I say? 
I'd have to say, um, I need a signature card now, right? Because I'm gonna have to compare the incoming signature of the customer against the signature card. Right, and this is gonna get too complicated for you. But you, you understand what I'm getting at. So I start putting in real code here. Okay? So, story in the same way that I just did in the code that we were looking at. But the main thing I want to get across is that there's that one-to-one -one connection between the code and the source. And that's giving me a lot of advantages. Is that if it comes if somebody needs to modify the code, the story in other words, I know exactly where you want to go. And if I don't have that, it's much, much harder to be agile than it would be if you did have this. Because there'd, there'd be a lot of searching. The other thing, the other point I want to get across is that when I'm done going through the process the way that I just went through it, what I'm going to have is the minimal set of methods to make this story work. I'll have exactly what I need, no more, no less. And that's, again, a good place to be. You want the code to be as simple as possible. And when I got done doing the story, I then go get the next story off the board and start doing it. And eventually, I have a program. So that's basically the whole process. Now, what we're doing here, though, is design. The artifacts of design are two things: my story cards and the code. Now, I usually go a step further. Those of you that were a couple of you were in my my postcon or my precon session. Um, I use CRC cards. I'm a big fan of CRC. Cards. So I would probably make a CRC card for each role. I'd make a CRC card for the guard, and I'd make a CRC card for the signature card, and for the card file. And I'd stick them up on a cork board, and I would connect cards that had collaboration relationships with pieces of string. Now, if you think about that for a second, there is no difference between that and a UML class diagram. Right? Except it's all much more flexible. And it's not inside the computer. It's not hiding in the computer somewhere. It's out where everybody can see it. So that is my design. It's a set of CRC cards stuck up on a cork board with some strings. It's a set of story cards, and it's the code. And that's all I need. You know, is that the, the only difference between that and the way we used to do design is the way we used to do it is that I would have sketched out the code in UML first. But what's the point? Just put it in the code. Is everyone seeing what I'm saying here? I might use a UML activity diagram if something's complicated. But that's all that I'm going to do. I mean, that's the only part of UML I use. Which is odd because when you type UML reference card into Google, my website is the number one hit, but I'm not using UML much anymore. Okay, is everyone following this? Good. So, a couple of resources that you should check out. Ken Beck's book in particular was written long ago, and it's still a spectacularly good book. Unfortunately, because it was written long ago, Addison Wesley and its infinite wisdom does not provide an ebook version. You have to actually get paper. I know it's primitive, but there you go. Um, <laughs> and I don't, know Ken, I don't know if Ken's book is available on the net book either, but he's talking about uh, all the way up at the acceptance list, the acceptance test level. Um, all the way up to the level that I was just talking about, I don't know if any books have talked about that directly. So we've just been through the class, so I understand how that works. But it's all basically the same stuff applied recursively to greater and greater and greater levels of abstraction. Okay, any questions? You talked about uh, only ever developing like the minimum amount that's required to satisfy the story. How do you in that example you're doing there, you didn't need the badge to satisfy the story because the story was getting into the room. The badge is needed to satisfy other stories. Well, so the how, how do you juggle that too? The badge kind of feels a little bit like I'm doing it because I might need it in the next. I know I am doing it. That, that's, it there's always a cost benefit. And the fact is, if I didn't need it, I would eliminate it. 
So if I added a badge and then it turned out I wasn't using it, then the first thing I do is refactor that badge out of existence. <coughs> and again, I have my tests in place, so that's relatively easy. I would eliminate the badge, everything would go red, and then I would make it go green again. And the, the um, but we're all programmers, right? In other words, we're not, we're not mindless droids here. We've all done this before. We, have, we all have some idea about how things are going to start playing out. Now, Austin's point about the badge is not, is a user really going to be happy with that? Are they going to start asking questions? That's, a, that's, I think, a more interesting question. Because we want the domain level stuff to be domain level. We don't want to start introducing stuff into the domain for the convenience of the program. So that's a bad idea. So I wouldn't just add a badge here. I'd, I'd go talk to my, I'd have a talk with my customers at that point. And maybe they'd come up with something other than a badge. They'd say, no, I don't want you to use a badge. I just want you to use your driver's license with the, dog, with the, with the guard. And then show your driver's license to the teller. And I'd say, well, the teller's going to have to verify again. Is that OK? And if the guy maybe says yes, then that's the way I'll go. I'll change my code to match the way he wants the, the story to play out. And I might make one programmer thing. I might say, well, can I call them credentials instead of a driver's license? It seems a little more general. And probably he'll agree to that. But that's collaboration. I was talking this morning about collaboration versus negotiation. That's just collaboration. Is that I've got some reasons, and I know you don't understand them, but is it OK? Does it make sense to call it, to call it a credential? And he'll go, yeah, of course. No worries for me. So this is, again, driving in the importance of having the customer in the room with you. If what you've got is a PO, not a customer, you're now in trouble. Because the PO is likely to defer to you as a programmer, which is a really bad thing. But a customer will push back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> OK. There really isn't any difference. They're really all the same thing. Just different names. So if you read Ken, if you read Dan North's stuff, the way that all Dan North's discussions of BDD start is, I was programming with TDD, and I noticed that my version of TDD always did things in certain ways. So BDD is just a discussion of that. And uh, you know, Dan would be the first to say, BDD is nothing but the way that I do TDD. And the, the, it applies to every layer here. Right? This is all basically TDD. So the, the one thing that I would argue is that pure GDD, the way, well, the slide's not there, but the way Kent describes it in his book, that's way down at the micro level, right? He's talking about individual methods and, and way down deep in the way the code is actually working. And as you go through BDD and ATDD and then my design by coding, it's getting more and more and more abstract, but it's the same techniques. Would you write um, unit tests underneath? The well, the, the lowest start. level TDD tests are pure unit tests. So if you go down to the level that Ken is talking about in his book, those are pure unit tests. But some of your user stories are quite big, maybe two, three, four days work. And writing. Well, you're, yeah, but as I'm working here, I'm not you're working on the entire user big. story all at once. I'm doing it incrementally. Yeah. Right? So one of the things that I'm going to be doing as a developer when I've got a story to work on is to say, how am I, what order am I going to implement? Right, but the, since I'm working this way, I'm going to do development in a different way. I'm not going to develop by class. Right, that's an important. That's that's actually an important point. I'm glad you brought the question up. Often, when people do code development, what they'll do is they'll say, "Well, I'll implement the employee class, and then I'll implement the manager class. Right, I'll implement the guard class, then I'll implement the customer class, then I'll implement the signature prior class." You can't do that if you're developing this. Because you're using little pieces of customers and guards and signatures and signature files from the very beginning. So instead of developing the classes vertically, if you will, you're making these horizontal slices through the classes. In order to get this little chunk of this little story to work, I have to modify these four different methods in these five different classes. Or five different methods in four different classes. <laughs> so you work in a different way. You're making slices, horizontal slices through a set of classes working on multiple classes simultaneously. This is a lot like aspect-oriented programming, if you've ever done it. Is everyone understanding what I'm, what I'm getting at? It's a different way of working. So um, 
the, the check-ins are going to be interesting in them because you're checking in five class definitions at once. The odds of a collision are higher, so you better be checking in a lot. Well, you know, a use case, I know Sandra and I agree about this because we've discussed it. A use case is an epic, a use case scenario is a story. And there's no difference between them. I think the difference in what he did this morning mm -hmm. was he did a lot in Enterprise Architect before he even got to the code. Could be. Whereas, whereas you're saying the code is the design. I go to the code first, so maybe we differ that way. I don't know. Maybe if, if you could chat, are you going to chat with him later? Maybe if you chat with him later, I, I'd like some clarity on that. Tomorrow. Okay, I, I have to do my Cassandra. We're having yeah. dinner tonight, so I'm going to talk. But the, 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 um, um, with any of this stuff, there is no one correct way, right? <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of correct ways. Um, I like to go to the code as quickly as I can. You know, is that I go back to that basic action principle that the only valid measure of progress is working code, delivering valuable code. So I go immediately to code because that's I, I see that as the quickest way to get something in the customer's hands. But you know, we're only talking ten minutes. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You said earlier uh, that if you had a test case that was if A and B and not C, yeah. you'd split that out. Probably so if I could three tests. If I could. Would you then have a fourth test that was the combination of Yes. So you, in your example with an ATM. They have enough money and the pin is valid, then to say it's not. Right. So you'd have a has enough money test. Right, so the have, have enough money test, test that's, a, that's a classic TDD unit level test. Yeah. And then the combined thing, that's the BDD level yeah. test. And you I would still up. have. I would, use the, I would use the low level TDD level tests to get to the point where I could write the BDD level test. And would that, that test, would that call? It wouldn't change out to the other tests. It would be a standalone piece of code that would be representative of the code that I would expect to find in the client. 